You're listening to your number one radio station. Open up, Colorado. It's 420. Time to grind and burn. This is not your son, Stoner Show. Welcome to the Cannabis Community Project. This is Brainstorm. Once again, bringing you your weekly broadcast podcast from the CCP Studios high up in Denver, Colorado. You're exploring the business side of this newly emerging economy, focusing on the patient, the retailer, to the geek in the garage, creating that next innovation in cannabis. This is the first media platform to help fellow cannapreneurs build sustainable businesses. Please welcome Cushley Odor Eliminator. They've come on board officially as sponsors of the Cannabis Community Project. Give them a welcome. Reach out and say hi. Yeah, the six degrees of Cushley. It's amazing. This week's show, we talk about some personal issues, personal issues in cannabis, personal issues with drinking, personal issues. You know, this show isn't all about smoking and joking. Really? Oh, yeah. He was dead. He never lived. He died, died, died. Seeking a call. Seeking the cause cause he heard the crying of the hungry ghetto children Heard the track paving the routes to a new prison Seeking the cause, seeking a cause He was dead on arrival, he never really lived Uptown, downtown, cross town, but he found the lower town Seeking the call, seeking the call. Ain't in the call for seven five dollars and get a shoe. Ain't in the call for selling wacky weed and cheap with you. He died seeking the call, seeking the call, and the call's down. Seeking him. By the time I was 17, I had successfully set in place a set of events that would affect the rest of my life. I didn't attend my high school graduation, but I did receive a diploma, one of those miniature-sized ones. The title across the top read, Southwest Open High School. For many, not having an accredited high school diploma would be a barrier to prevent them from finding a decent job. I didn't care. For me, it was actually an accomplishment. I didn't attend my graduation. I mean, I was pretty much sent to juvenile jail. I spent my 18th birthday away from home in a facility, working through what was called behavioral rehabilitation. It was actually a good cornerstone to working in the corporate world and being a manager. (laughs) So here I was, going into the world, young, 18, out into the public on my own, with a basic high school education and a long list of criminal records as a juvenile. So as expected, the next few years didn't bring much opportunity. By the time I was 26, I had filed for bankruptcy. I had a DUI and basically skipped out of my probation because my wife was pregnant in another country and didn't come back to the court date. But it always sounds exciting to say fugitive. It was at this point when I had a revelation, meeting various people from other cultures and perspectives, having conversations in another language often makes you think of things you would have never thought of. I didn't know it at the time, but it was this basic idea, this introduction into learning about how to change yourself externally to change yourself internally. You see, the person I was in high school, the teenager, the troublemaker, whatever name and title you could put to me, whatever track I was on, your experience, your education, your past, having to admit to others what you've done and who you were, 
When I came back to the States from a five-year stretch in Mexico, I was faced with all the same demons I was faced with before leaving, or as the judge put it, skipping out. So I had to confront them. I had to take my three-year-old daughter and my wife to the courthouse with me as I turned myself in. I had to have them come to court with me. And I had them there when by the powers that be graced me with an incompetent DA who was highly unprepared, which allowed me to instantly start my life over again in the States. I didn't take it for granted not having an education as a teenager because I just didn't know what it would provide. But as I worked through my bachelor's and then eventually my master's, and still the dream of a youngster, I feel the fire to move forward. When I put this show together, it was basically a tipping point in my life that said, I'm not going to wait anymore. And that tipping point came just a few years ago when my brother, only two years older than me, passed away from leukemia. A struggle he dealt with, but a struggle that brought him into a cannabis culture and a lifestyle that we both had in common and was probably the only thing we ever connected on. (laughs) And we both took the same passion and interest and learning into it, that when he passed, I decided almost in his memory and my intolerance for waiting, I was going to put it together. And it just clicked. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I didn't want to have a stoner show. That wasn't what I was about. It wasn't what he was about. I had to have something that was still rooted in who I was. And previously, I had started my own little businesses, trying to raise money for individuals who felt like they had no other opportunities. They weren't educated. They weren't well-skilled, but they were looking to start over in life. And it was through that business when I realized, well, here's one that can easily be related to cannabis because it's the same idea. And this is why every show at the beginning of the show and throughout the show and in my interviews and conversations with people, there's always this underlining thread, this topic of, are you an entrepreneur in this industry? industry of choice or are you here out of lack of other opportunities the bank's not hiring and the burger king is not paying and the conoco down the street wants to do too many background checks and uas so where are you left in life where are you left well now in colorado we have the ability to not just have a core cannabis industry of growing and selling but now we have the ability to create hundreds and thousands of businesses, micro businesses, sub businesses all around this industry. And if just a handful of people in each of those are employed, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of of individuals being employed. So the transition was very natural for me to go from this previous business idea of helping the unemployable become self-employed to basically working that into the cannabis industry of taking people who are forced to be self-employed. The world is looking at us saying, what is going on here in Colorado? So we need to show them the professional side of what it means to be a cannabis industry. So the transition was natural. The only thing that was left was the channel of communication. I knew I needed to communicate somehow with the audience out there, with people out there who are looking for this information. And the natural answer was a podcast. Ever since I was a kid, radio has pretty much been my, my second brother. My friend, the the thing that was always in my ear, always having your station, and whether it was music and then eventually talk stations where you become unknown friends with the host and you know them intimately. I consume probably 20 hours a week of podcasting on my own. I put almost 20, 30 hours into this show. I spend most of my life based around podcasting. So this was the natural channel of communication through the internet. So it came together that the Cannabis Community Project is this blend of media and business and entrepreneurship and cannabis. Well, there it is. That's a little insight from me to you about what this is all about, this community right here. And if you want to be part of this community, you can support us in any way that you want. You can listen to us every week because I see those numbers. I see them on the analytics. So when you're listening, I know about it. You can leave comments and likes and share with your friend, family. You can call in and participate in canifessions. You can come on the air and talk about your business or your idea or your, or your thoughts about cannabis. This is your community. I'm just here as the portal. And this is the way we're going to make the world change. By going out there and doing it. In the causes in front of him. In the causes in his skin. In the causes in his speech. In the causes in his blood. But he died seeking the cause. Seeking the cause.
what's the name of the Bitcoin brand? Uh, it's it's not so much a, a Bitcoin brand. Vizcorp, our for-profit corporation, handles that. Uh, and right now we are looking at getting an office in uh, New York State so that we can get a license, a financial license, to do more transactions in Bitcoin, kind of move up into the exchange platform level. So it's all under this VizRed company. Who will accept okay. Bitcoins and what's the well, value can, of changing my dollar? Anything you can buy with a dollar, you can get with Bitcoin. I can. You can. I already have a dollar. Why do I need to change it? For example, you give me 20 American dollars today, okay? And if the same thing happened from today that happened last week... Is this one of those setups like you no, give no, me no. 20, I'm not put it in your pocket, in your money. I'm not interested you give in your me money. like a little slip of paper and then you walk away and I'm like the sucker, right? No, it's not even a slip of paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, then the value of increased about a hundred dollars last week. So your your twenty dollars would be worth what a thirty dollar forty dollar not quite double. So probably thirty bucks around there. So you guys are brokers of bitcoins. Uh, we buy and sell bitcoin here. Yes. Well, it is a digital currency that is, you know, it's created electronically. Uh, you have your little bit miners here that are a specific type of uh, computer, a little different than your standard processor on your normal computer, to run a specific huge amount of strings of uh, data separately. Like, it's got a little different process of hashing. With Namecoin, you can generate .bit domains, which are yours and which no one can take away from you. You know who you guys remind me of? What was the name of the guys in the X-Files? The uh, three... The, all those the, the the three, geeky uh, guys in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> first thing that the U.S. did when Bitcoin first was becoming, you know, a thousand bucks Bitcoin, they made political campaign donations when Bitcoin legal. That was the first thing they did. So with the removal of the Silk Road and by the FBI, I mean, you're looking at tens of millions of dollars in Bitcoin. But the reason why a U.S. dollar is valuable is because if we wake up tomorrow, it'll still be a U.S. dollar in 10 years from now and so forth, you know. That's the excitement with Bitcoin. You wake up tomorrow, Bitcoin could be worth $2,000. So that, that layman's trust was they just got this bit license and I, but I believe what so, I had read was that it, they were doing some kind of like exchange or, or something to do with yeah. that nature. These are big exchanges, U.S. exchanges. It's being embraced, but there was originally resistance and controversy. Right? Oh, yeah, no, there's I mean, it's been not just my fantasy, controversy right? all over the place. Think about yeah. it this way. Yeah. Flash memory or the memory that's in your phone um, in museum conditions degrades very quickly and it sometimes just spontaneously disappears. On a hard drive, a hard disk drive, it little stronger magnets there, and, and so under museum quality conditions, it can last a lot longer. Longer than your lifetime. This is good. Lesson number one, only use a desktop. There you go. If anybody, for any one of those reasons, wants to reach out to you. Or just go to your browser and type in viz.red. Viz.red. Yeah, yes, that already. Yeah, come by anytime. We can fix any items that you have, any electronics, computers, and help you get things running smoothly. <laughs> If you have an idea, a business, perhaps just some thoughts about cannabis, contact me. I want to hear from you. I want to discuss these issues. Health, food, music, growing, technology, business, everything else. CCP. months how's that uh the baby yeah is it weird to be, have a baby again 
No, not really. No. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it's weird. I don't feel like it's, you know, anything out of place. It okay. was expected, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, but it's going back to the sleepless night. Probably sleeping through the night by now, right? I, I don't feel I don't feel like that much time has really passed mm. since my daughter 7 years ago. I don't I can I still feel like I'm still coming out of just that that kind of cusp of getting her to that age. Yeah, I, don't, right? I don't feel like it was that long ago where... Oh my gosh. I do. When I, I was just looking back at pictures on Facebook of... How many kids do you have? I have four. Four? Yeah. How old are they? 16, 13, 7, and 5. And really, I mean, I should just start saying because Rose and Miranda, my two girls in the middle, they'll be 14 and 8. So it's really 16, 14, 8, and 5. So you must have had them young. I was uh, almost 25 when I had Tanner, my oldest. Yeah, that's pretty and good I was, age. 37-ish when I had, 36 or 7 when I had uh, Max. So, yeah, a big gap. <laughs> I think it's better that way. I grew up with a brother that was two years apart and then a sister that was about seven years apart. The two years, I think, is too close. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Should we record a bit? Sure. And as I drill you for 500 questions. That's all right. <laughs> That's what conversations are about, right? So, I trust you. Um Oh, well, now that I said that. <laughs> you always help me. Like, every two weeks, I'm like, I always leave new conscious, like, man, I did not plan for this job transition at all. You, you <laughs> I didn't know, answer the right questions. You know, what, you know what it is? I'm, I'm glad you look at it like I'm helping you, but oh, it's yeah. not really coming to any place to go like, who can I help today? I'm going to a place really trying to learn for more, more for myself. So when I talk to somebody about things that, that I'm interested in or that I've had experience with I'm more trying to vet out what do I already know what do they know what am I what's going on here that I could learn from what's going on here that I could give some type of counterpoint like oh this is interesting that you do it like this because I've always learned it like this but I'm always really just trying to learn more for myself and I, I think sometimes it comes off like like I'm just always like going up to people and being like hey you should do this and this and this and this but what I'm really doing is just trying to engage with people to just learn more stuff get enough interaction out of somebody where i can feel like oh this is what the person is trying to do and this is what they're doing and oh i remember when i did this you know for some other job and, mm -hmm. and it helps me kind of learn and develop what i look for in in people is uh, the riff right the ability to communicate with people and go back and forth mm -hmm. and have a um, thoughtful conversation where you can just both respond learn. to you right? yeah yeah and we can't think of everything like you bring up such things that i never think about i haven't worked in sales in my entire life so for you to come and see it from your point of view makes me think, oh, wow, I, I like the way you thought about that. I would have never seen it that way. And respecting that point of view because it's almost like on-the-job training. I'm right. learning how to be a salesperson. That is the only way to learn. There's no degree in sales. There's a green degree in marketing, but you can't really get a degree in sales, right? <laughs> um, you can go to management school, but there's no real how to be a salesperson school. And learning how to do marketing is not really going to help you that much in sales unless marketing is a contributing factor to your sales, but there's no real school. So the only way to learn is to, as I tell my daughter, practicing is learning. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Just fake it or fake it until you make it or yeah. repetition, repetition, repetition. Yeah, just just doing mm -hmm. it. So people respond to me in all different ways. You know, I, I meet people and that's just naturally how I am where somebody says, hey, I got a business and this is what I do. I'm just naturally like, really? What's your business? What do you do? Tell me about it. I want to know because I'm interested. I'm curious. And I think sometimes people respond to like, oh, who's this guy intruding into my life? <laughs> Why does he have 500 questions about what I'm doing? And, you know, suggesting things and they, they think it's like a combative type thing. Like, when I say, oh, have you have you tried doing this? People take it like very mm -hmm. combatively. Like, what do you mean? What are you trying to tell me? You yeah, know? there's different. You have to figure out the <laughs> approach because everybody responds differently to just people in general. You right. know, you have to understand how they communicate. And it's tried to, hard to assess somebody within 30 seconds. Yeah. You know. And for me, I'm always used to just being blabbermouth. I'm used to if you're a stranger, but you say, hey, I work at the fire station. I'll just be like, really? Well, do you guys still have that pole? Do you slide down it? You know, who stays <laughs> up all night? You know, do you still have a dog that runs around? And to me, it's just riffing, you know, yeah, you're just, yeah. you're just engaging with somebody. It's not really at the end of the day, like, oh, damn it, where's the fire pole? And the, you know, it's just, <laughs> just talking with people. Yeah. And when I find somebody that responds to me, then it's real easy to engage. Mm -hmm. uh, when I find somebody that just kind of stares at you, thank you. 
people there. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's hard to have conversations with people that give one word responses and there's nowhere to go with it. So right. I feel like I'm just hammering them with one question after the next. Well, that's and it's different like, if oh. you're approaching somebody to talk about your business. I'm talking no, about I, when like, I approach I, somebody to talk about their business. Well, no, that's, that's what I'm saying. I talk about their business, but you say, okay, or like when you get to know somebody, uh-huh. you'll say, oh, where are you from? And they're like, Denver. <laughs> and then you're like, okay. And then so they're like, oh, you, how long have you lived here? Like it goes into a series, but it's yeah. when they don't banter back, you're right? Pulling like, teeth. like, yeah. yeah, it's like, oh, okay. Now they'll reciprocate. Do they want to learn more about you? That's a perfect segue into a heady, healthy lifestyle. Let's record. Yeah. We're not recording. I was, I was recording. That's how natural and casual it will continue oh, to be. Oh, well, good. <laughs> Hi, I'm Becca. AKA Hetty Becca. I'm an independent consultant with Healthy Hetty Lifestyle. We are in home cannabis education and vaporizer demonstration. We're the Mary Kay of the Mary J. So, similar to your Tupperware, Mary Kay, jewelry, Pampered Chef, we come in home and do cannabis education. As a Medicine 101, we talk about um, how cannabis is processed in the body from your smoking or vaporizing to edibles. We talk about the different strains, the sativa, indica, hybrids, and we talk about the healthy forms of consumption. So we talk about how the combustion or smoking is the stress that is added to the body, um, and that's what we're trying to avoid. And many people coming back to cannabis don't want to smoke, so they look to the edibles. But the edibles are a different type of high. It's processed different in the body. So vaporizing is a good alternative to that smoking and having that reminiscent or that high that you used to have in your younger years. And then we talk about how vaporizing, you can control the effects that you're going to have from your cannabis as the lower temperatures are not going to quite give you that euphoria. You'll get the medicine, but won't have that high feeling that you're maybe not looking to have all the way up to the highest temperatures, not combustion, but then have the intense highs. So we're tools to consume everything but the dispensary to your door so that you can have the information and the tools needed to go to the dispensary and purchase your cannabis. Cool. Are we ready to record now? No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> that was not 30 seconds. Well, how long was that? Too long? That was like a minute and 42 seconds. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been given a lot of pictures lately? Yeah, I do a lot of networking outside of the cannabis industry because yeah. that's my target market. Because I'm targeting myself, essentially. I, I call myself self-diagnosed crazy. Um, I don't have my medical card. I am wrecked. So I turned 40 last year and I told my husband, I'm like, for my 40th, I want to go to a dispensary. I want to see what it's all about. I found out my son had been consuming and I didn't know how I felt. I'm like, I know I see it at the parties and I know I've done it a handful of times, but usually after I'm drunk, which isn't always smoke first. And then if you're going to drink, drink second, there is a proper order. So I started educating myself and I really used it because I wanted to drink less. I did feel like I was drinking too much and I didn't like showing that to my kids that that was okay. That's a powerful one. I want to get into that, but let's just real quick establish what exactly heady healthy lifestyle is so yeah. everybody understands yeah. what you're talking about when you say you're consultant and mm. you're, yeah. you're doing something. Let's define for people what exactly it is you're doing. So who are you as a company? What do you sell? And mm-hmm. how do you go about doing that? So healthy heady lifestyle is a direct sales model similar to other direct sale models that you're probably familiar with. Pampered Chef, jewelry, there's lots of different jewelry lines. Direct sales, meaning I buy from somebody and then I turn around and sell to somebody? Yeah, but you don't have to have an inventory. So a lot of the companies now, you have your own personalized website. If I come to your house for a consultation, I go through the catalog with you online. Oh, online. Well, we do have a paper. So the one thing we should talk about Healthy Hetty, maybe a little bit of background, is Healthy Hetty is a startup company. It was started in, or grass roots company. It started in 2013 in Massachusetts by husband and wife, and that's Holly and Steve. So Holly's CEO and founder, and Steve is president and co-founder. Because when the medicinal marijuana passed in Massachusetts, the way they wrote the laws, it was so strict that people couldn't even open a dispensary. So even though they could issue your medical marijuana card, there was nowhere to purchase your medicine. So they started Healthy Heady Lifestyle to give people the information they needed once they got their prescription or their medical card, you know, what they needed and the tools to consume in a healthy manner that wasn't smoking. So through vaporizing, when they decide what goes in the catalog, they test all of the products. They want to make sure that they're reliable. They have great warranties. They're very simple to use, majority of them. And we're talking about strictly vaping. vaping. That, that's what the company exclusively sells. Right now, that's been their main focus. Okay. But we do have small accessories like uh, jars to hold your cannabis, either flour or concentrate. We sell the Cushley line. 
The six degrees of Kushli. <laughs> it's amazing. Which is an organic spray that kind of helps eliminate the smell. I love, love Kushli, it. Yes. Yeah, I love Kushli. Mm-hmm. We have the couple edible machines, uh, the magical butter and the Moda pot. Did I say it right? Moda pot. Moda pot. And then we also have um, the Mary uh, Nutritionals. So Mary Medicinals um, is a line that's here in Colorado, and they have different forms of consumption as well. So they have the transdermal patches. Um, they have like a salve, a cream. Um, and so we sell the CBD ones because that's non-THC. So anything in our catalog does not contain THC. But their Mary Medicinals would be found in a dispensary. So if somebody was looking for the THC, they could at least know that there is an option for like a transdermal patch mm-hmm. and they have spot pen. I, I know their lines so a bunch of, bunch of products, bunch of vaping. Mm-hmm. So you take these products and you pack them up in your car and you go out to where to sell them. Yeah. So, um, I look for in-home consultation. So somebody that is, I call can of curious like myself that is heard that maybe they want to use it for sleeping. They're not sleeping well at night. They have tried those prescription pills. Probably we all have heard the horror stories of Ambien. Yeah. Um, or Lunesta. I know some people, they just don't react well to those mm-hmm. ones prescribed. But using the Indica and smoking a high temperature at night is a perfect sl- sleeping pill, essentially. And it works naturally with your body. So and you're those not gonna... contacting you are less than experienced yes. individuals, first timers, mm-hmm. older people. Yeah. Or it could be anybody. Well, I would say, you know, my age, a little bit older because my age, I'm in my 40s. We grew up cannabis or marijuana. We didn't call it cannabis, call it marijuana. Weed, pot, it was illegal. It was known as a drug. Anybody that did it was a bad person. And we all knew the stoners. I think we have to reframe generation that grew up in that war on marijuana. And now we need to teach people the beautifulness of cannabis and that there are options for your pain management, options for sleeping or arthritis. You know, there's so much research going on time, research on cancer that it actually can cure cancer or people use it during cancer treatment. Almost unlimited ways of using it. Yeah, there's so many different ways to use use the plant. It's not just about the high and the recreational fun. Yeah, it has that component, but it can be used in different ways for a medicine as an alternative in your life. So how does somebody find you? They're Googling Denver, who can help me consume for the first time? What, what are yeah, some of the keywords? How are people finding you to, to get in this unique situation where you're kind of educating somebody, you're coming to their home in an intimate manner? Mm-hmm. How does that come together? Well, right now, I've really just been hitting the pavement. I attend as many things and just talk to as many people as I can and hoping that just the sheer conversation that I'm able to start. People so you're just will... walking down the street grabbing people <laughs> well, and be like, not... hey, have you vaped yet today? <laughs> you have learned about it? Are you secretly in the closet wanting to vape? <laughs> right. I ca- that's why I, call, I called myself. I came out of the can of closet in August because I connected with Healthy Hetty in May and then I realized, you know, my market space, not necessarily, I see the mar- or the cannabis industry as my power partners. Um, um, because they have so much information, right? I, I like to see myself as a, an arm of a dispensary where the dispensary doesn't have to actually take their time out to educate a new individual or somebody's looking for vaporizing, having to keep that inventory in their dispensary. And right. then when somebody comes in to purchase it, then having to spend an hour trying to describe it to them where they could refer them to me right? and I could actually spend an hour at their home letting them try, you know, several different vaporizers. I could ask them questions. Where do you consume mostly? What type of form? And what's your budget? Then I a whole can, evaluation. Right. Kind of like an evaluation. Yeah. And I could say, okay, I'm going to bring these four devices that I think would be a good fit for what your um, pattern is or what your consumption method is. And then they could try it. Some of these devices come with a good price tag. And so if you're going to drop $300 on a vaporizer, you know, this is your chance to try it before you commit. Yeah. Dispensaries are not the most inviting places for newbies, a little intimidating, Mm -hmm. right? And not really set up to deal in an intimate situation, regardless of the fact they make you sign that paper that says, you know, what's your pain? What are you here for? And all the Mm -hmm. the kind of academic stuff they ask you. There's nobody really there that's looking to sit down with you and have a conversation about why you're using and how you're using. And of course, as soon as I say that, I'm going to get emails from people (laughs) saying, F you, obviously everybody that's there is there for the, you know, the good of the will and 
sitting there to teach you and everything. Take your mom to a dispensary yeah. and get the reaction and see how she feels. Regardless of what we say, that obviously, yes, people are there to help you and work you through it, blah, blah, blah. The way they set up dispensaries and the way you have to go through this the back ID room. Check. Yeah, yeah. yeah, through the steel keeps door. It kind of secretive and the whole, still yeah, and in, in the closet still a little bit. And it makes bit. you feel a little awkward. It and does. then you walk through and people are staring at you and then you got to go up to the counter and pretend like you know what you're doing, pretend like you know what you're looking for. And then you walk out of there with either you spent way too much yeah. or you got all these edible, you don't even know what you're doing. Right. Now you got this stuff, now what? Right. Right, what's the next step? Right, you spent way too much and you, you have too much <laughs> that you're taking home and you don't know what to do with it. And you probably don't have the urge to go running back mm-hmm. to do that type of transaction in that manner again. Yeah, and I'm new too. My first, I got lucky, so I feel like I was blessed. The very first dispensary and I said I wanted to do that on my 40th. We did that, I think, the day before my 40th birthday. We went to Live Well on Broadway there next to the Girl Scout. I'm like, oh, great. Here I was five years ago buying Girl Scout uniforms, and now I'm going to the dispensary next door. And Girl Scout but, cookie strain is an excellent strain. I, I had think. that this week, this past weekend, actually. Did dabs for the first time. Oh, wow. We can talk about that later. <laughs> I got the best bud tender. His name is Jesse. I hope I get that right. He was at the Live Well Broadway, and I actually, ironically enough, ran into him at the bud tender appreciation last one at right. Green Labs and he told me he was on Laramie but I said if it wasn't for you and the experience I don't know if I'd be this far because he took his whole time I think we were there for 45 minutes and you got to think about it's just like a, a restaurant right the yeah. longer table sits there the less money you're bringing in less tips not only that the guy sitting behind him on the couch is getting pissed, pissed <laughs> right so I think it would be great if there was a dispensary that was for newbies right or maybe dispensaries could try a healthy heady program mm. where that person can come back and get a little bit more information and education and really reaching out to the customers because I think that that's going to be this differentiating factor as the laws change Mm -hmm. and people's attitudes change and the way we perceive it. Also, the other thing too is I didn't even think about it is the names of the cannabis plants. So you go in and let's say you pick something and I'm just going to put Maui Wowie out there. But then the next time you go, so okay, a month later, I'm going to say a month because I probably, I mean, now I go a little bit more, but I was probably only going once a month of that to the dispensary. And so you go back in, I'm like, I can't wait to get more of that Maui Wowie. Well, now they have Jesus OG. Yeah. And you're like, well, okay, well, well, there's no commonness. I can't go from dispensary to a different dispensary and see the same name and same strand. And if you do, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the same. Right. I I, I go to a number of dispensaries and there are same name products. And when I take it home, it's the grower. It's not the name. Um, You know, just because something is called a Durban poison, it's the grower that determines if it's a Durban poison because you go to one place hey i want a maui waui and you take it home and then you go to another place and they say here's maui waui and you take it home and it's something completely different and your experience could be different and that's not what you were looking for especially when people are very concerned about controlling their experience that's a side effect of the regulation and lack of regulation in general on a bigger level of where grows come from and seeds and naming and classification the whole deal something out of our control yeah absolutely i think but those are the changes i think that will be coming in the years, kind of just looking forward, there'll be definitely, I think, more consistency for people. I don't ever really ask for names. When I go in, the way I talk to my bud tenders, I talk to them about Mm sativa-based. Hybrids are okay as long as they're sativa-dominant. I look at pricing, and I look at the shelf life. If the guy hands me a jar that's full, and he says, here's a good deal, this is on discount, and the jar's completely full, there's two things that instantly click for me. One, nobody's buying it. The jar's full. that's why it's, Two, it's on discount <laughs> and they're trying to get rid I of it always ask, to I, it off to me. I always ask for the special <laughs> and I usually always get it. Because again, I feel like I'm still a new shopper. Right. I need somebody to take me shopping that's even more experienced than me. So how do you do this? Do you, you walk into somebody's living room and you just start pulling out devices, vapes? Mm-hmm. And- so like being an independent consultant, back to your question, is I'm just like an independent rep with Tupperware, jewelry, you literally carry products with you. I don't carry products with me because they, but I would order online. Most okay. most direct sales now rarely have inventory. So how do you do an in-home consultation if you don't have? I do have a, my kit. So in my kit, I have, I believe, about six devices. So I give them a folder and I have all the educational material that we talked about. There's, I think, four or five pages. And we kind of go through that. I try to keep that depending on their knowledge level, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 minutes. If it's a group and it's all newbies, yeah. 20 minutes. And then we move on to the vaporizers. I 
first go through the personal vaporizer, so the ones that are portable, you can take mm-hmm. them, you know, you charge them, you All can take them too. everywhere you go. So if you consume mostly outside of the home, you know, I would recommend a personal one. You don't consume at home, you consume out and about at, you know, social function. Then we move to tabletop, and then those are the ones, you know, if you're consuming at home, if you only consume at home, I would always recommend a tabletop because it's more powerful, it's going to have a longer life, you don't ever have to worry about if it's going to be charged or not. Some of them are cheaper than the personal one. So depending on budget, you know, like go with the tabletop. Some of those packs is going to get pretty expensive. Yeah, the yeah. packs is two seventy nine, dollars um, but there's more expensive ones than that for a personal one, like a 300 mark. Because um, again, this is just starting out. So I'm the first Colora- adopter in Colorado. I think we may have three or four more now, uh-huh. but I was the one that started in May, the, the early adopter. I call it the first adopter. The company's still growing and getting its legs. So right now they're in the development of their website for their independent reps. So just like if you met another direct salesperson, they would give you their business card. You would go on to their personalized website. So eventually I will have that. When people order, they're ordering. Then they can order. Name. So even if I come and bring in the information and they're still not certain, they could still go to my direct website and then order the product. I would get the commissions directly When you to set them. these up though, you present it as it's a free consultation, yeah. mm-hmm. but the products are there for sale and that's where it's known. So yeah. people know that it's like having a Tupperware party and being like, what? You're going to sell me Tupperware at the end of this? Yeah. Nobody told me anything. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's because it's a new concept. It's <laughs> something that people have got to get their their brains wrapped around. Yeah. It's like, oh, you're going to come to my home and we well, might... you say it like a party. Like they yeah, could rent party. you out to like supply not you, but you could rent out your equipment for a party. Is that? Well, we, or it's um, a party because you're coming over to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's kind of, I kind of see it as both. It depends on the avenue, but of course I love just the hostess one, you know, right. like you'll have the party. 10 people is good because there's a lot of interaction and yeah, people get to talk about cannabis, how they either used it in their life or, you know, what made them stop or why they came back to it. Because most of the parties that I've had so far are usually 420 enthusiasts. They're already using the product, mm-hmm. but they don't really know all of the vaporizers out there. So this is a chance for them to actually get a look at what other options are out there besides smoking that they mm-hmm. they might want to change. Because smoking can draw the smell. It's almost like I have options for you to be discreet when you're out with maybe not 420 mm-hmm. enthusiasts. Like I use my Kind Pen. I use it for concentrates. But I use that on the go when I'm out at a party with drinking and stuff. I just yeah. use that. I go, I use it in the bathroom. It has such little odor. Most people think it's just a cigarette. Cushley is a great way to follow that up. Right. Just a I keep my Cushley yeah. in my purse so I can still have my social time with my cannabis and my friends and I'm not isolated outside smoking a joint. So you're, you're the first. How's it going so far? Are you able to make a living from it yet? Well, no, I'm not making a living yet from it. I um, So, but the idea of Healthy Heady Lifestyle is to supplement an income. They made that clear when I started in May. To um, supplement, meaning not intended to be your full main time. Gig. Yeah, yeah. But but in my mind, I was like, you know what? There's so many women out there, and I shouldn't say women, but men and women who do direct sales, because there's so many direct sales out there. I, I've been referencing the most common ones, but you can name one out. Is mm-hmm. Amway one? Mm-hmm. Sure. Great competitor, American. Skin care. I mean, the, if there's a product, there's probably a direct sales model out there for it. And people do that for a living. They do that full time and they usually make more money yeah. and they're more successful. Not It's not just about the money, but they were able to stay home with their kids. They were able to provide just as much of a contribution to the family, if not yeah. more, working less. And I kind of saw that as one of the first adopters. Maybe this is something I could actually do. I can finally do direct sales and have that balance between my family and my work and still have maybe an even more successful career than what I was doing in the finance world that I've worked 17 years for and I end up at a dead end. Do you have a time frame that you need it to happen in? Like if it doesn't happen in six months where I'm making enough money, I'm <laughs> I'm going back to the cubicle. No, no, I am not. So the one thing I know for sure is I'm not going back to what I was doing. I don't even want to think that as a safety net. I'm all in on this. And, and I wouldn't say I have given it a time frame because cannabis and the new regulations and the change is happening now. So I'd like to see where it goes as this changes. This is just the start. I'm just scratching the surface. But at the end of the day, the business model is selling products. Yeah. End of the day, it's selling product. You and I talk a lot about how I can refine my sales tactics, right? Well, and what is be, your background? Well, my background is operations. So I started in the finance world. I started at Merrill Lynch in 1998. 
I answered an ad in the paper. Okay, this is how old I am. Remember, we used to apply for jobs out of the paper, not through websites. And I, I was waitressing and going to school. And it was hard to make the bills. You know, I was 22. And so I answered the ad and it was a wire operator for Merrill Lynch. I worked in the cage. I didn't know anything about finance. <laughs> I ran this wire thing because at the time, financial advisors couldn't place their own mutual fund trades. So I had to place mutual fund trades. I had to direct wire to the New York stock trading floor. I did the mail, took deposits. I mean, it was just operations. Before you got into that, your background was coming out of high school? Well, no, I was in college. Or? Yeah, odd jobs. I worked at a manufacturing company called Most. Okay. I did assembly line work for a little bit, and then I moved out to be a secretary or a receptionist, okay. admin assistant. So then you went to school for finance? No, I actually started school to be a teacher. I wanted to be a math teacher. High school math teacher was my goal. So you just kind of stumbled into finance. (laughs) Because of the need for money. And how long did you do that? I did that for 17 years. In some form or fashion, I've been working in the finance industry. I got my licensing in 2003, so I had my Series 7, my Series 63. I got my life insurance at the time. I was working for a financial advisor, helping him build his book of business. And then I moved on to Charles Schwab in 2004. And that's how I got into equity compensation, which is kind of my fourth or my niche. Um, Equity compensation. Yeah. So if a big corporation that trades on the New York Stock Exchange, part of their compensation package to certain individuals, I usually the executives or, you know, the upper crust of the corporation gets also equity compensation. So you get a wage of, let's say, you know, six figures, and then you get restricted stock or stock options that vest over a certain amount of time. So companies need record keeping services for that product or the equity comp plan that they offer. And then they want to have a website for the participants to be able to transact and see the value of that compensation. So your job was to make sure the stock crashed right before people got fired. <laughs> <laughs> that's an equity yeah. compensation. Yeah. Well, that can happen. I mean, that's a risk. But I manage projects. So um, Bank of America Merrill Lynch offered a package for corporations, the record keeping platform, and then the website. So after sales, I would onboard those projects and I would work with the corporate client and multiple people on a project to take them from sales to the goal live of using our services. That's a great corporate background. (laughs) Why wouldn't you carry that out into retirement? This is very stressful. The position that I had was a lot of deadline. And we know we know people, but people are notorious for procrastinating, not doing their job, but yet they still have to have the project go live. So you're dealing with the corporate client and their expectations. You're training them. It's like, I was thinking, about it on the way over here. Okay, they have this functioning body, we'll say. Well, now they want to switch to a different body. So basically, you have to dissect the body that it's in right now, and you have to see how it's functioning today and what are the gaps. And then you have to look at how that plugs into the new body and are there any gaps. So you're basically rebuilding it on our side. So you got to unplug it here, rebuild it over here. And of course, it has to go flawlessly. There can be no mistakes. You're scrutinized from the client and internal. A lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. So not coming from a a place where that was your life goal, the pressure probably just outweighed the desire to stay involved in that industry. Well, the desire was to move on, to grow and to progress to the next level. So be my goal was to be the director or at least senior vice president of that group. So I did the, the implementations and the grant work and I got the knowledge and I was the best. Most requested implementation manager for all the projects from the FA. But in the end, it almost shot me in the foot because I became so good at what I did, I couldn't move on. And then it just started festering and festering. And then I think I just imploded on myself. I ended up not getting the promotion because I was so unhappy because I was not going anywhere. And I never, and even trying to move outside of into a different group, I just felt like Maryland's just, or Bank of America just basically said, this is all you're good for. You've hit the ceiling. You've hit the yeah. Glass. And that's a lot of work. I, I really put my heart and soul in the last eight years into that. And to watch it kind of implode for over a year was, heartbreaking for me. It's because I'm a giver. I'm a perfectionist. I I take pride in my work. I think it's a reflection of my reputation. And I'm a sensitive person. I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. And I do get hurt easily. So I'm learning how to keep my boundaries and not let things imp- impact me and know that I, I can only do so much as one person and forgive myself. So it's been a great thing because I've had to turn 
and look at myself. I've had to really look at myself in the mirror and see who's Becca. What a great actual foundation for for sales, though, even though you may not realize it. Um, A lot of what you're doing, building a great foundation to be a great salesperson in that sense, from just what you've told me so far of kind of what you were doing and how you were working through that. What was the actual catalyst? What took you from, I'm at Merrill Lynch, unhappy to a mat heady healthy lifestyle now i'm happy where did that happen so that was happen? probably a year ago so okay. a year ago is when it all started so and i've been looking to move and i've been looking for jobs and applying trying to basically take what i've learned and gained over the 17 years and maybe apply it to a different corporation a different position you were already looking yeah out, already kind yeah of scratching at the wall but at the same time i'm like i'm going to basically take this mask off and put on another corporate mask i'm going to be doing almost the same hmm. thing it's interesting in a different capacity, and then am I going to be unhappy in five years? I like that that wording that you're wearing a mask. Yeah. Right. Right. A corporation, and you're just replacing it with another mask, mm-hmm. which implies what you're really looking to do is just not wear masks. Right. Right. I want to be. I want to be me. I want to do something that that drives me. Well, what was your 12 years old? What did you want to be? A teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. And I think we can be teachers in different forms and fashions. Doesn't mean I have to work in a school. I've been training or teaching people about equity compensation for the last eight years. So now I don't do that. So now maybe it's I use what cannabis has done for me and teach people that, you know, this this could be an option for you. Might not be the answer. It might not be what you're looking for, but at least it's something to put into your bag of options. Where did you see Heady Healthy at? At the canopy? Where did you first... I actually um, connected with them through Craigslist. So I realized that my career was falling apart at Merrill Lynch. I had this really bad project and nobody would back me. I I told them the plan couldn't go live. I ended up having to take it live. And basically it just spiraled out of control. And so then I'm like, I definitely have to get out of here. But I didn't know what I was going to do. And again, I was trying to apply for jobs and trying to find a job is not as easy as it used to be. <laughs> there's 200, 1,000, there's, your resume might not even make it through the auto screening that these companies do. Young kids dying to be compensation uh, <laughs> managers. Right. <laughs> So yeah, it was difficult. It's almost like you had to know somebody to get through the firewall. And then um, I had been consuming cannabis for about a year and I was um, talking to him. Why did that start? For my drinking. I was drinking a lot. How much? Well, every time I would go out, it would be a minimum of four drinks. A lot. For I would say minimum drinks for four. Four martinis. When you would go out. When I go out. Not at home. At home. I started drinking a lot more at home. I think that's what bothered me too, is that I would drink more at home. Daily? Yeah, daily. Like I come home, have a glass of wine. And then I like that glass of wine, so I'll have two. And then maybe by you know what I have the bottles down. Well it only takes three and a half glasses to right. a bottle of Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a bottle of 750 and, milliliters of, of wine. Yeah, and of course hung over. It just wasn't But you say that like life. it was just happening for those few months. Like, no, I've, my, I've drank my whole life. Um, to that type of excess. Well, I would say every time I go out for a social event, it was always to excess. Yeah. Were, were you drinking alone? Yeah, I started drinking by myself. Yeah. Were you hiding it? No, not really. Yeah. Because I think drinking is acceptable. If somebody says, oh, I have a glass of wine or two glasses of wine or three every night, nobody questions. But you weren't home alone having glass three, husband comes home, oh, it's just my first glass type thing? No, 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 no. I was pretty open about how much I drank. Yeah. <laughs> what type of of a drinker were you? What, what happened to you when you... Get pretty loud and obnoxious. My husband always says, well, you get to the point that you're, it gets uncomfortable and awkward for people. For people. <laughs> But, for people. Like when you're in public or at yeah, home? Yeah, either. <laughs> Loud and obnoxious how? Like um, angry? Like No. Silly? Yeah, or? silly. Okay. Silly. Um, everybody says, oh, and fight Becca. She's so much fun. She's the life of the party. Silly, just not... <laughs> Not in a controlled, fun not way, in a controlled more fashion. just kind of an annoying, out of yeah. control way. Yeah. Silly, but nobody else can be in on the joke, kind of kind of silly. <laughs> then it turns into slideshow night, right? You only remember certain things. Like I used to, I love comedy and Bill Burr has a whole skit. If you ever want to Google it, it's hilarious. But he talks about him getting arrested, getting pulled over for DUI. And he's like, it was like this, shushing. I'm like, I'm pulled over. And then the next thing I know, I'm, I'm handcuffed in the back of the, the truck. And the next thing I know, I'm doing a breathalyzer at the 
cop shop. It's like he can't remember every little detail right. in between. It's connected by moments of <laughs> sobriety, <DUI>. or you <laughs> can have clearliness in the alcohol. <laughs> Do you have any arrests, any DUIs? No, I don't. No. Thankfully, no, I don't. Have you ever been fired because no. of drinking? No. Have you ever had anybody say anything to you because of drinking? No. But this was all my talk to myself. Did you ever go through a period where you were just couldn't get to work on time, couldn't pay bills, weren't able to function? No. But it was to the point that I haven't been able to get a bed for the last year. Because I, of depression or because of drinking? You know, I don't know what it was. I don't... I, well, I think it's depression. So I think the drinking was because of the an- anxiety and the depression. Because I was on Lexipro, I was on Wellbutrin, and I was on Xanax for the days I couldn't get wow. my shit together. And then, of course, I was drinking with all of that stuff. I could have easily died. Easily. I know a friend whose nephew, 20 years old, died. Oh, yeah. Didn't know. Never take Xanax. Drink wine and Xanax, gone. Yeah. It's like our kids should not die for being kids. And yeah. we're not teaching them how to be responsible and it's try. Not just kids. That is how people yeah, are dying. That's nowadays. how, right. Pills and alcohol. And we Mitchell take that risk. Too. Adults but, all the way. That's mm-hmm. how people are dying. Yeah. And I think until it hits close to home, people think it can't happen to the ha- them, but it could be your time anytime that one too many drink or you've damaged your liver so much from too much Advil or Tylenol and alcohol that you can't take one more pill. You know, I just think we can be such a healthier society. And so you does that were, make sense? It does. You were in bed, kind of unable to... Well, just trying to get myself to work. Um, so that was going on for like a year. I quit my job. A year of struggling to get out of bed every day? Mm-hmm. Wow. And I saw so this, so kind of been a progression. I got off of all of my pills um, this summer. So yeah. I've been no pills for, what, four months? And then I quit my job. So I'm doing this full time. So, so I went from a paycheck to self-employment, which means little paycheck and to are, zero paycheck. Are you a, a two income family? We were two income family, but right now we're one income. So we're having to make a lot of adjustments. But the other thing too, is I've been suffering with digestion issues and I just haven't figured out what that is. I'm a yo-yo dieter. I've gained and lost weight umpteen amount of times. And I do think gaining this, I lost 60 pounds a couple of years ago and then I put it all back on. The body, it's a lot. Oh yeah. Body, and my yeah. mental state, I'm like, why can I not be successful at this? I was just such beating myself up. Well, this time I, my stomach has just been such a mess that I haven't had an appetite. I can't eat. I don't even know what to eat. So it doesn't make me feel yuck. So I started seeing an acupuncturist for another reason. But I'm working with a chiropractor as well. They're both helping me with my nutrition. But the last um, almost 30 days, I've done the whole 30. That's basically a paleo diet you take out. But I'm even more restrictive. No fruit, no form of sugar, meaning carbs, bread, even things that you think are healthy like quinoa or oatmeal or whatever. And no alcohol. And so about two weeks in, I actually am feeling good. I'm actually waking up on my own. I feel like I want to get out of bed. And it gives me the energy to pursue my self-employment. Because even after I quit, I was like, I still feel the same way. How am I going to make this work if I don't feel right? I mean, if we take alcohol out of the equation and we just put somebody in a self-employment position, forget about struggling with alcohol. Yeah. Just you're a normal straight laced, middle class, whatever, and you're going to go work for yourself, that in itself is an extremely difficult task. Yeah. And it's one yeah. that's taxing financially and mentally and emotionally. And your health is probably the only thing you have to hold on to, right? <laughs> right. Because there's not much else, right? You know, your support system when you're working by yourself is very limited. Finances are very limited. And just your own inner confidence is kind of limited a little bit. Where... Oh, yeah. I believe, believe me, for the last five weeks, I mean, it's been good the last couple of weeks, but, but there's, there are days where I'm like, I am the biggest idiot ever. I'm great. What am I doing? I have four kids. What am I doing? But everything that's happened since I connected with Healthy Hattie May, I am accepting what's coming my way and this is my path and I have to do it. So I just try to keep open to what comes my way. Which means you have what's inside going on. Now you just need to figure out the external tactics of how do you actually Execution. do this. A lot of times it's the reverse, right? People have all the external, everything they need, the support, the resources, but inside there's nothing there's there. There's no passion. That was how I felt at um, my last job. I, mean, I knew yeah. so much, but I, at the same time I had to problem solve. But at the same time, I didn't feel like it was saving lives. We're putting so much pressure on me for a go life. Nobody's going to die if this project doesn't go, right? (laughs) And I feel like people are dying out there. Cannabis could be something that saves somebody. Like, I feel like it saved me. I like reached out and said, you can have this life that that you dream of and you can do it. So go for it. This is your chance to do over. That's why I wanted to talk to you. (laughs) For my do over? (laughs) Well, 
yeah. for that mm-hmm. statement. You know, I'm not looking to talk to the CEO of Live Well. Somebody else's show can do that. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to talk to the biggest grower in the U.S. You know, I'm not looking to talk to the biggest stoner in the U.S. Other shows can do that. And they do. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, as people say, you're a soccer mom. I, yeah, I have four kids. But I work, too. I work full time. But I don't fit the, your stereotypical. But you fit my show. Because yeah. that's exactly I'm what I want. I was to search a couple of stoner, but what I'm finding out as I've been diving myself into the cannabis world is mm-hmm. that we all come in all shapes and sizes and backgrounds and this commonality of cannabis we share. Right. And it just brings together that diversity that comes so naturally that I feel like some things are forced. It's nice to have meet like-minded people that feel the same way. It's just so welcoming. And I'm hoping that as the changes, more people feel comfortable saying, yeah, I use it for X, Y, and Z. I don't use it to get high, but I definitely want it for my sleep. I want it for my arthritis. I want it for my digestion issues. The hope is with the media right now focusing on these new laws that are allowing vets to be more open with their doctors and engage in these conversations. The hope is that will be the door that lets what we're talking about everything else in. Because right now you can't, I can't go to to, uh, Dr. Cohen and and tell him I would like my card because I'm an alcoholic and this helps me. I remember talking about that. I agree, right? It's like, that should be a legitimate conversation. You might in your mind, nobody might ever told you that you're an alcoholic or you don't feel like you're there, but you know you're maybe five years away from being an alcoholic. Well, how can you transition off of alcohol? I think people, they live in an absolute world. Well, then just stop drinking. <laughs> you can be an addict to anything. So that's like yeah. being a food addict. I feel like I have... Just stop eating. Right. Well, you can just say no. Well, it's not that easy. Yeah. And it gives people the tool maybe to move off of that thing that could be killing them. Right. And it might not be forever. Mm-hmm. It might just be to get them in a better place so that they don't need it anymore. And that's that's what I'm hoping to be able to bring forward that other people can hear. Mm-hmm. When I started this, I started it with that same concept. There's an industry here, and I want to focus on the industry because I like focusing on it. I like business, yeah. and I like the marketing, the sales, and the creation. I also believe there's another story there. And the story is those who are transitioning into this business as a business, not because, hey, this looks interesting or here's a way to make money. But as I tell people, I don't have any other choices. I don't have any other out. This is it. But I believe there's enough people out there who want to be in this business that would do great. And I believe there's an even greater number of people who are like you and like me where we're looking for something in our lives, a change in our lives, Mm -hmm. something with a little more meaning, something that we can put ourselves into and make a living out. And that's really what what I'm trying to do here is not just say, hey, let's let's go work at a dispensary. It's let's take people like you. I thought that's when I said I was going to go into the marijuana business. I was like... The weed business is what I said to my husband. I didn't know where to start. So I just started Googling. And the only thing I could figure out was I needed my um, support badge. I needed to go fill out this form with the state and go through a background check. And then I get my badge for $150. And they have a $300 one. So I did that. So then I was looking. I'm like, okay, so now I'm going to make $10 an hour, mm-hmm. which is, believe me, I take that right now. <laughs> but I'm like, is this, being the, is this making the best use of my tools? And I do. I would love to you know, work in a dispensary for a week just to get the information and education. There's other avenues into the cannabis industry. It might not just, my thought was just bud tender. But as soon as I got my badge, that's when I got connected with Healthy Hetty. And Healthy Hetty has opened up this whole industry. I met them on Monday. By Friday, I was at the Women Grow First Annual Summit in Edwards. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I mean, I was surrounded by a hundred women that were starting in the industry in over the last year or had been in for a long time. But what a great opportunity for me to meet all those women giving me the courage that you, I can do this. Right. And that's what we should do is just provide a support group. I think we should have a monthly meeting that is based on this idea of people coming that have a similar story where they're trying to change their life and they want to use cannabis as the reason to change and as the way to get that change moving. And as I mentioned before, you may not find a lot of groups and events out there that fit that. So you might just have to start your own and I'd be more than happy to do that with you because I think that's a valuable thing. I do have a couple meetups out there. So I started the Canna Curious Club 
It's on Meetup. I actually haven't done an official meeting yet because I'm, I'm nervous. I'm nervous. I don't know where to have it. I'm working on those things and I want speakers, you know, speakers that are going to bring the information that I might not have. I'm here to connect people. I would love to have one about concentrates. I think people hear a lot of negative information about concentrates and how they're made. And so give them a little bit more information about when they go to a dispensary, what they're looking for when they buy that product. More educational type stuff. Yeah. yeah. Or if you have Crohn's disease, you know, finding somebody that specializes in using cannabis to um, treat Crohn's disease. Just all those things that people can get that additional information that they can then take that little piece and then move to the next step. It's going to be a process. It's not like you're just going to go to the dispensary one day, get a sativa hybrid, go home and smoke it and everything's better. It is a progress. Yeah. You have to do some mushrooms too to finally break through, break through, break on through to the other side. It's, I, I was describing it to my friends. It's like drinking, right? We all tried everything under the sun. Well, I don't know. If you're a drinker, you tried everything under the sun when you were little. little I say little, but younger. You know, you did the rum, you did the beer, vodka, whatever it was. And then you feel like, okay, I don't like that. I don't like that. I don't like that. But my drink of choice is wine or vodka. You have to go through the same thing with cannabis. You got to kind of figure out what what you're going to use it for and how you consume it and the fact. And then you find what you want and then you can just wash and repeat. I would like to start a third group that's more based like a like an AA group. Oh, okay. Where it's people who are trying to get off whatever and using cannabis to get off. <laughs> yeah, to, I, to, I, I agree because you can, you can see that with any kind of drug, right? What about uh, if you're addicted to prescription pills? How are you going to get off of that? I, I come from a similar background as you do where give me a reason to drink, right? And I, and I got it, right? <laughs> I, happy hour. I mean, look at it. We celebrate the end of work every day. Happy hour. It's acceptable to have yeah. one to two drinks every day. And without a support group, support person, anything, right? It, it's very easy for somebody to be like, hey, let's go out this Friday. Mm-hmm. You're not going to find me saying no unless I'm broke or something, but... <laughs> The, the thing is, is I have the ability to say no when options are available, right? Yeah. If I have the ability to stay home, I got my sack of marijuana and I got my Netflix run in, sure, I can say no and I can be pretty strong about it. Mm-hmm. Take away my sack. <laughs> ask me if I want to go out and see how fast I put my shoes on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I can see that. <laughs> because see there's, that. wait, like in me, you can see that? No, I can, <laughs> I can, I can see, I can relate. I'm saying I can relate. Like no, I, I can relate. I think that's been a transition too, is how do my social outings look now? Because yeah. I don't go out like I used to. Well, because now you need a, a new group of people. I know. And typically they have to be people that don't drink and only smoke. Being deep down here in the burbs, like I just found out that you kind of live close to me and there's a couple other um, people that I know. Finding that tribe in a close vicinity is important too because I do feel that I'm driving so far for my tribe as I say downtown or north Boulder the culture up there is so different than down here and I find myself to be very out of place I, you know I, I don't walk around with weed t-shirts on and I don't, <laughs> I don't have Me joints neither. sticking out of the back of my ear and you know just some of you would look at and be like yeah that guy is we're different we're right a different now. market <laughs> sp- we're a different market space and I think that's going to be another distinguishing factor as the industry moves on is that there's going to be different target markets. There's going to be companies that say, we want to target this demographic. This is what we're looking for. And you're going to be providing different services than if you're targeting the younger. I like my anonymity. Anonymity. I used to not be able to say cinnamon. I I couldn't say oxygen for a long time when I was a kid. I had trouble with my Y's and L's. I could say like oxygen in there. I I yeah, you didn't or something. Couldn't say it. That's funny. But I, you know, I have some part-time jobs that I go to. I like the idea that my coworkers never even would think that I would smoke. And when they do, they always kind of give me this eyebrow like, really? See, and I was the the opposite. (laughs) Um, My This is just tells you how good my boss was. So when marijuana went legal in 2014, my boss like, well, in a big meeting said, oh, Becca, I figured you would be there the first day. And I'm like, what in the world makes you think that I am a consumer of marijuana? So your boss called you out as a stoner? Yeah, in this meeting. And I was like, I don't even know anything about cannabis other than a handful of times that somebody might have had a pipe or a joint at a party and I was already drunk. I don't call that cannabis use. I just call that you just did it because it was there. I never, I didn't ever have my first sober cannabis until <laughs> a year and a half ago, my, my 40th birthday, the day before my 40th birthday. I look back at my life as just a, 
a series of transitions. When I was in high school, I was that person where somebody would look at me and be like, that's the kid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, I was all in black, had my black steel-toed combat boots on, wearing my, you know, probably some death metal t-shirt, had semi-long hair, and <laughs> that was the look. And then I got a little bit older, and my hair really got long. But um, <laughs> I can't see you with long hair at all. I used uh, to have long hair, up too. Up until uh, seven years ago. I, really? I, I have to see a picture. Uh, well, I always wore it back, pulled back in a ponytail. So okay. I always had, like, uh, you know, the tight pulled back, yeah. but then the long curly long Oh, ponytail. okay. I, I can see that. But I still want to see a picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but even then, I, I, I started out at Wells Fargo when I was 18, and then w- worked through mostly, you know, mortgage and banking and that okay. type of so stuff. So you're familiar with a little bit of what I do. I love wearing suits and ties. I like it. I like dressing up in a professional manner. I like parting my hair to the side and putting in the hairspray, right? I like little that. handkerchief pocket. <laughs> I, I have a pen with my Some name on it links. that I put right there. That's when I pull out my, my rings and stuff. I don't wear a wedding <laughs> ring, but it's mostly because of a size issue. Oh, my but... <laughs> husband's lost, lost two of his. We just buy his at Walmart now. Yeah, I'm just, just like, not, whatever. I, I'm thinking about getting rid of mine, too, and just... Yeah, it has nothing to <laughs> do with it anything matter? else. It's just, I don't, I'm not, as you can see, I'm not a jewelry wearer. I don't wear things around my ears, yeah, neck, yeah. hands, wrist. I, I don't like that feeling. And when I have my ring on, it's always... It's just in the way. ...playing with it and stuff. But when I go to an event, I find myself being in the middle of a crowd of pants sagging, hat lowered, cool guys oh. that know how to talk the slow talk and yeah. how to say the, <laughs> the bud things. And, right? And I always find myself lingo. being like, the, hey, guys, how you doing? How would you, anybody here want to smoke up? I'm, I always I feel said, very out of place. I said doobie the other day. I'm like, oh, there's a doobie circle. And someone was like, tell me, like, do they still do doobie circles? I'm like, I don't know. There's an app called the doobie app. I don't know. Brothers. I do, too. I do feel a little. That's where I'm like, I'm looking for my own community, right? Yeah. I'm looking for newbies. my community of not newbies. Not newbies um, just people who are more like to be professional. Yeah. But at the end of the day, they're stoned. Right? I mean, I consume every day, yeah. most of the day. But a lot of us have, like you said, we're married, we have kids, we have day jobs, some of us, and we can't be out and about gallivanting all the time. We do have responsibilities still. So some people may have started in the industry sooner, or they've always been involved in some way. They've lived their life openly in that community. Mm-hmm. Now, people that may have not always used it, you have, but some people are coming back to it. Well, now they're bringing all the stuff they've developed since they stopped doing yeah. it 20 years ago. And, and this is how, when I talk to somebody and I ask them a few questions, how I get a good sense of kind of where they're coming from with their experience. I've had the privilege of smoking nonstop since I was a teenager, which means I've had the ability to be a young person who smokes co bricked in swag weed and know what that does to you. Is that different? Oh, yes. Is it really like, is it high sativa? Like, no. Complete opposite. Oh, really? So think of back to the 60s, 70s, where we get this Cheech and Chong look. Oh, okay. That stems from the type of weed that was predominant in the U.S. up until the last 20 years. Which has been indica. Which has been predominantly indica, okay. sun-grown, outdoor-grown, mm-hmm. coming uh, grown mostly Mexico, and then packed together in bricks and trucked through the border, you know, in gas tanks and other forms of getting it across the border. So by mm-hmm. the time it gets to you, you would get a bag and you would have to break apart your weed. This is oh, this used to be okay. a very common thing that when you, you would have to break up your weed. Nowadays, people don't know what the hell you're talking about. You'd have to break <laughs> it up because it would be all bricked together because it was trucked okay. in. So if you think about quality of product, yeah, it's being pressed together. It's being stomped together. It's being wrapped up in plastic. It's being shoved into gas tanks. By the time it gets to you, it's the most trampled on... Right? All all the crystals and the trichome, everything's oh, just knocked off. Oh, of it. okay, yeah. So, what so you're it's left not as strong? Is, well, it's, it's not more as sedative. strong from a THC standpoint, oh. which means it's going to be a very heavy CBD. C- CB- CBN. It's going to be a plant that's going to have non THC qualities to it because of the it's way. It's going to be more in your body. and. This is where we get the smoke, get the giggles, get the munchies, oh, and then fall okay. asleep. Okay. Because this is what the weed would do to you when you would smoke oh. it. You would smoke it, you would get high, you would get silly, then you'd get the munchies, you'd eat like crazy, and then you'd fall asleep. That was okay. ever since up until about 15, 20 okay. years ago yeah. when the whole indoor hydroponic thing kind of started to explode. When California started to legalize medicinal marijuana, the indoor grows, the kind bud, the chronic, right? Dr. Dre's album, The Chronic, was this whole revolutionary thing of this weed that you would buy, which nowadays is just common, everyday, indoor, hydroponically grown yeah. thing. 25 years ago, 
there, there wasn't all these different names and strains. There was, you got Kind Bud, you got the Chronic, or you got that other shit. It's the <laughs> You got the Skunkweed. Sk- oh, yeah, right? That's that, what that, I always heard of. Right. That's how I said it's that, Skunkweed, yeah. and I'm like, well, I don't know what that is. <laughs> right? So just, just uh, you know, a half generation forward to my generation is a swagweed, right? <laughs> but same same concept. It's just <laughs> okay. shit that people are cultivating from Mexico and then packing and shipping across yeah. the border. So uh, people's experiences now are not going to be similar if they're not getting that type of weed again. Well, this is where you talk to somebody and depending on how they depict the situation, let you know when they kind of stop smoking. Mm. If somebody stopped okay. smoking prior to the last 10, 15 years and they're talking like in this Cheech and Chong type way, mm. then it tells you, oh, they must have grown up in the 60s or 70s and that's what weed was that's what weed was you smoke it you get munchies you fall asleep you know that that's what it was and it was very demotivating type weed it's hard yeah. to be an active entrepreneur when you're you're chowing down a bag of doritos and then fall asleep <laughs> on the couch right that's why i say i stay away from the indica during the day but even nowadays you could you know girl scout cookies that's a pretty good indica you could smoke that and probably be pretty active all no it's I the don't quality of production cookies. is what i'm pointing out oh is that yeah it's, yeah it's not so much the indica sativa thing it's more of the quality of growth the mm-hmm. quality of production what we have now is a better product when i smoke now i am very much focused and active the weed is kind of like the little fire start it pushes me in that direction yeah because i think it helps shut the chatter down <laughs> i get so like i don't even know where to start i've got so many things to do i don't know where to start so i think the sativa helps me like okay focus get things go put together yeah. and it helps me put the problems together that i see fourth you know i've got four kids i've got to get this done i've got it helps me just boom 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 get the stuff done without getting too wrapped up in my head so it kind of gives me the clarity that i need the sativa does that's what it does to me it gives me clarity and it when Mm -hmm. i'm tired I smoke and it yeah. wakes me up, yeah. which is counterintuitive to somebody who has no real experience where they think you smoke, you go to sleep. That's how it used to be. You're you're outdated, man. Tell them that next time somebody talks to you about this little Cheech and Chong type. See, you're, you're, you're a 1.0, man. The world of <laughs> weed has gone on to 2.0 because that's it, so yeah. outdated, this idea of, of the demotivated stoner. Mm-hmm. If you're demotivated, that's just you. <laughs> that's <laughs> your personality. That's you. That has very little to do with what you're smoking. Right. That's like saying, well, the alcohol prevented me from being a functioning human being. No, you prevented you from being a functioning <laughs> human being. The alcohol just allowed you to have that as a good excuse. Or you're you know? using, yeah, or as I say, you're using it as your numbing. What are you using to patch the pain? Right. What are you using to not deal with that thing? Everybody um, uses medicinally. Something. Even mm-hmm. if you think you're using recreationally, you're using medicinally. I, I say I use it for both, even though I'm not, again, medicinal. I definitely use it for my high anxiety days, but I use it as my social, like, last night I had my happy hour and I went high. Yeah. I look at it like this. If I didn't eat today and you get home at the end of the night and you're just in a bad mood, you haven't eaten, you're all blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, look, every time you eat, you think you're all euphoric, but look, you can't even handle a day without food. But wait a minute. Shouldn't you go, no, I think it's the other way around. I think I'm supposed to eat. That's why I'm in a good mood. Mm. When I don't eat, I get in a bad mood because I haven't consumed the food I I need. Yeah. That's how I look at my consumption of cannabis. It's not oh, it's not okay. me saying, I see. "Oh, I need a smoke to be in a good mood." Mm-hmm. It's I need a smoke like I need to eat because if I don't, at the end of the You're day, crabby. my whole body's out of whack just yeah. like if I don't eat, I need to get in my belly, right? I need to get the cannabis in my in, yeah. in my system just like I need to eat on a daily basis to be functioning. It's mm-hmm. not it's not so much how high am I getting. It's this idea that if I don't use my day is just in general worse. Yeah. How I feel, how I treat other people, how mm-hmm. I think, how distracted I am. Yeah, and it's, and it's not who you are. I feel that too. I lost that sparkle in me. And actually, I so a couple of coworkers had come to my happy hour, and one of the girls told me about this guy that worked with us and said, you know, I miss Becca. <laughs> just something about her. She always would bring me up or, you know, she always had a light about her. He was a little bit longer than that, but yeah. th- that was the gist of it. I'm like, well, that's really nice of him to say that because I didn't feel like that's what I projected there at the end. But that's who I am. I and mean, people like you light up a room, you have that smile, you have that joy, that optimism. And I felt like I was losing that. It was that's... becoming harder and... And 
the, I wasn't being who I wanted to be. I'm like, this isn't me. That's Not so this. funny you say that because I've had that feeling for a number of years since I've come back from Mexico where I was for a good five years where my drinking really escalated to a, a dangerous mm-hmm. point, like drinking a complete liter of tequila by myself. How many years ago was this? Over seven? Uh, five years ago. I came back to the U.S. five years ago. How long were you there? Five years. Oh, okay. So I came back five years ago and I was there for five years. And during the time I was there, uh, ironically, you can't get weed. Um, People don't (laughs) believe me when I say this. Mexicans are not into smoking weed, despite the fact they grow it and send it here. They just legalized it somewhere in there. Yeah, Yeah. just recently now the whole country. But people don't believe me. They're a drinking culture. (laughs) They're not a sit around and get high culture. So despite the fact that's where our weed came from and Mm -hmm. still for a good part comes from, that's not the culture. So for that five years that I was there, I, I was not able to get my daily whatever I was used to, which as a result, you were drinking it spiked to a, a dangerous amount. Dangerous, not just for my health, but where it was becoming dangerous for those around me oh. as, as a result of just... T- was it tequila? That was the drink yeah. that it ultimately en- ended mm-hmm. up with. And it was the drink where didn't didn't really like other stuff, but it was also the drink with the highest sugar. That screws with your head. Yeah. Um, sugar, because like I've been off sugar for almost 30 days. I feel amazing. I went to the hospital because I had a triglyceride count of over 1,100. So I'm tri- assuming that's really bad. Triglyceride in your blood are the fats going through your blood. A normal would be below 150. Oh my God. <laughs> which means I could have had a heart attack at any time. Yeah, so you could have died. I could have died. You think about all those close not, calls. Not just from health perspective, but of the type of activities my drinking was mm-hmm. getting me engaged in, running around at early hours in the morning, fighting with police on the street, looking for more booze. Yeah. I would buy a liter, five, six o'clock. By midnight, it was gone. Well, midnight's Jeez. not my bedtime. Oh. Um, you were still three, functioning? Three, no, I would I, in blackouts. Oh, yeah, yeah, in blackouts. Yeah. You know, this is the point of dangerous interaction. Yeah. Running around the streets of Mexico City at 1, 2 in the morning looking for a local corner store that's open that still was open to buy whatever they had. Yeah. If it was alcohol-based, whatever it was, at mm-hmm. 2 in the morning. When I got back to the States here, I immediately got my card within a couple months. And within that same time period, stopped drinking. Yeah. I, I had How was not, that? Uh, that tough? It's like my stop cigarette smoking something that I don't think about it anymore yeah when I have I, I tried to have a shot with uh, Jim from Weed, Weed Wipes oh okay yeah yeah when I was at his house doing an interview I tried to have a shot just really expensive I just couldn't do it oh uh, was it tequila no oh. it was some really expensive like bourbon Scott. oh yeah scotch some I don't know it was some some really expensive some I was like hey there's an expensive bottle of booze he brought it up put our shots I got like halfway through You're the like, shot it's burning the I put the show. shot down I was like I'm sorry man I, I don't want to waste it but I, it's just gross it's grossing me out I had such a visceral reaction to it, it was, well that's good it was though. disgusting and that's yeah. now now when I walk when I smell cigarette smoke I have that same reaction yeah it's like, Ugh. like what the fuck Ugh. it's, it's <laughs> I don't get it because, because it probably because it brings back those memories yes Probably because it brings same back like, memories. Be, well, yeah. same with being pregnant. There are certain smells that I still can't stomach today because it reminds me of being so sick. Mm. And I'm just like, I'm, I can't do that smell. You know. Well, for the better, maybe. Because now I still feel like, okay, thank God I didn't take this into my 50s. Yeah. Oh, you no know, kidding. Thank, thank God, because I would have been dead by 55, 60. You know, thank God mm-hmm. I'm not that guy that you see who's just lived his life in a bottle. And you, you look at him, you can just physically see the manifestation of what alcohol does to people over time. Or it doesn't even have to be alcohol. It can be any lifestyle that we're doing. Yeah. The way we eat, the way we don't, That's we're not active. Yeah. But again, I think the changes have to come from within. And when I'm learning, and it's not a simple program. Hmm. Maybe if you have 10 pounds to lose, maybe 20. But if you're a yo-yo dieter like me and, you know, you can swing 80 pounds in a given year. Oh, I've, I've dropped five just sitting here with you. I'll raise 10 by the time I get <laughs> home. <laughs> There's something. So that's what my my journey has been. What is my deal with food? Um, we have the same struggle in that manner. And it might be as simple as just saying, well, that's just addiction. You know, we're just, we're just addicts in that sense. But I think what happens is that it becomes a physical addiction. So as the doctor I'm working with, he's like, you have so many bad bugs in your intestine fueled by the sugar that it tells your body more and more and more sugar. Like um, Little Shop of Horrors, feed me, Seymour. It's telling yeah, me, feed like me. 
biological, a physiology, and it might not, and it might reaction. be in a healthy form, right? He took all fruit out. I love. I'm my talking piece about what's fruit. happening up here, though. But seventy percent of all our head function comes from our gut. If we have an unhealthy gut, our head's not working properly either. So I think it's a matter of understanding what foods are causing us to have that imbalance. It's a mind, body, spirit, mind, body, soul. Right. Everything needs and to be it, in and harmony. It, it's it's yeah. in harmony, but I think that there's so many things out there that don't teach that harmony. And I think cannabis is part of that harmony. The reason why I say for me why I think it starts in the head is because mm-hmm. when I'm going through my hypermanic stages where life is good, or, you know, like the Lego song, you know. Everything, yeah, everything is awesome. I got it on my cell phone if you want me. <laughs> I tend to want to exercise. I eat healthier. I have a more regulated eating. I'm not overeating. When I'm on the other spectrum of that where I've dipped down and I'm going through my days or weeks of The low days, yeah. Um, I'm overeating. To the yes. point where my stomach is like stretching and I'm still... I know you still eat no matter how much... I'm the right. same way. And I always think... I thought maybe I was diagnosing myself as bipolar because I feel the same way that I, I don't know how to live in the middle. Yeah. I'm always on the outsides and the extremes. And that's you know how exhausting it is to live in extremes? I find it only exhausting when I don't find reciprocation. Mm-hmm. Which means when when I'm in a, a hyper stage, I'm looking for somebody to latch on to that same hyper hyperness and be like, let's do it, damn it. Let's build this company. Let's do it. Let's stay up till four in the morning. Let's go, go, do this. Go. Let's do this. I'm looking for somebody yeah. to be like, yes, let's do that. When I'm on the other side, I think I'm looking for the same thing. I want somebody to just dive through a bottle or, you know, eat 10 pizzas and, yeah. you know, crawl under the bed. You know, as they say, misery loves company, company right? Yeah, and, yeah. and I think it goes the same for the hyper side is, mm. is what I'm, what I'm constantly looking for is somebody to match where I'm going. You're energy. Right. And what I constantly run into is people going, oh yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about starting a business. And me going, really? Great. I love starting businesses. What are you doing? Let's do it. And then people going, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm not. And then because going, then they realize then getting frustrated and being like, God damn it. What the fuck? You just told me you want to start. Yeah, you didn't reply to my email. What's going on? You said, because you have all of the energy and the drive and people aren't up to your level. So then they see it as like exhausting or that's too much work. I was just talking. I wasn't really going to execute. And that's what's frustrating to me is being met with a constant disappointment of expectations mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. meeting somebody who's like, yeah, man, I love doing shows. Let's do a podcast. And then four weeks goes by and it's like, what happened? I thought you said you were like all into doing shows. I yeah. thought we were going to do a show. What's up? Well, you know, all right. All right. It's like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you have to have people move on their own timeline, and it, it can be frustrating when you're moving faster well, and they don't, they don't not quite there yet. But you know, it, it does come. For Patience me, is the hardest thing to learn. I it think. is, as as I try to teach my daughter, <laughs> right? Uh, oh, my kid. Yeah, don't even get me started on <laughs> patience with four kids. Oh. But to me, <laughs> it's one thing to have patience, like somebody saying, "Hey, can you do this for me?" You know, wait a few minutes, let me finish it. That that's one aspect of patience. To me, it's more of some. Somebody saying, hey, you want to do this? And me going, great, let's do it. Well, there's just no patience there. It's somebody engaging, saying, do something. But then who takes the next step? Do you follow up? Always me. It's always me first, which ultimately I think leads to frustration and anger because Mm -hmm. it's always me where if I meet you on an event tonight and you say, great, let's do something, expect an email by tonight or tomorrow morning for me, which means my expectation is you're going to respond to that, then mm-hmm. I'll respond to that, and then we'll progressively move forward into what we said we're going to do. That whole exchange can take four weeks. <laughs> Not in my book. They're out. <laughs> you get four hours with me. Gosh, and I feel like I haven't been responsive enough to you, and I'm pretty responsive, but I'm trying to be more chillax. <laughs> I, I find my myself world. to be in, in sometimes a lonely world surrounded by people who I think are, are like-minded. Everybody's standing around me, shaking their head, going, yes, yes, mm-hmm. yes. And I still kind of feel like, well, then why am I so damn alone in doing it? Why am I the only one starting this business? Because then? really in their mind, they're thinking, <laughs> I got to do this later. I, what am I going to do tomorrow? Oh, yeah, I got to run that over to her. Their mind might be distracted. Yeah. Yeah. I consume by myself. I consume with people. It has no effect. Um, my wife does, does not smoke, does not consume any cannabis. Yeah, my husband doesn't either. Never has. Um, it's just not her thing. But my husband's just so, he just is so comfortable and... 
every aspect I think of his life. But the thing is, I don't know that. I shouldn't say that for sure. But he used to be a big pot smoker. He actually had a plant growing in his closet when he lived in Flint, Michigan. So he had a bad experience. What the hell? I know. He had a bad experience. I need to have a talk with him. Yeah. <laughs> Bring him over. He ate, he ate brownies. Somebody made brownies. He ate them. They were at a ski trip. And he's like, ever since then, I don't want to go there again. So I think people have a negative experience with cannabis, not knowing exactly maybe the surrounding was different. Maybe it's a different strand they're not used to. They consumed it differently. Like he probably, I don't know if he ever done edibles, but edibles is a different experience. But that that's also sounds like a personality difference of someone who's just probably normal. Because from what we've just described. My husband tells me I'm not normal <laughs> and, I'm t- and I'm coming to grips with that. I'm a not a normal person. I hear that at all times. But I I'm keep not looking not back normal. at people and saying, no, I'm the normal one. You're all from crazy. <laughs> that's what I like to think too. But I'm realizing maybe I'm a little off. But you know what? That's a good thing. I don't want to be like everybody else. I want to be Becca. I don't care if I'm like other people. I just want other other people to go oh that makes sense like when I say something to go oh yeah validation that, that makes sense yeah like right. haven't like I told my husband I'm like you know I feel like maybe the first 40 years of my life I haven't had a uh, say on my life yeah. I haven't been validated and this is my chance to see and do my next 20 30 years with my decisions and not doing it to make somebody else happy I want to create the app that lets people get your whole biography and insights to who you are because I feel like 70% of my interaction with people is I'm just fucking around, right? <laughs> but I don't think that comes because you off. Because to- you did that with the, um, cause, and plus I was high, but you're like, you need to get three things. Get a hat, which I bought a hat. Cook some bacon and know your why and who. That's not joking so, around though. So I got I, I got advice. the I got the hat, but of course I was so high. I'm like you had to keep going back over it like four times, and I'm like <laughs> I kept going back to the bacon. That's why I kept saying metaphorically. I know. <laughs> Don't actually bring bacon to the next event, but I it's a metaphor. This. It's a metaphor in sales that sell the sizzle, not the bacon, right? Yeah. People buy because of the sizzle, how it sounds and looks, not necessarily what it is. Yeah. Bacon and its raw. Form Form is not appealing. It's slimy, fatty meat. <laughs> what should... sells bacon? It's the smell. smell. It's the oh, sound. Oh, it tastes delicious. Right? It's, it's the that t- crunchy. And I'm starving, so right? I can describe it right Not Crunchy. And... That, that's what that is. is it coats bacon your tongue and you're like, mmm. But that's a whole different, that's a, that's a <laughs> tactical sales conversation of how you're actually setting up your table and pre- doing a yeah. presentation. Those are valid points. It is. They valid What I'm talking about is just in general, my general interaction with people is just, as I said, the riff, just to. Mm-hmm. Just to go back and forth with people. I don't think people quite understand that about me. And I don't think I present it as joking enough where I think people think I'm serious. Well, because you have a very dry sense of humor, <laughs> which I, I love because I have to pay attention to you. And I love people that engage my mind. So if I have to really pay attention to you. But this is where the disconnect happens is in my mind, 70% of my interaction with people is I'm just messing around. Yeah. Just having fun. Just seeing what kind of interaction goes on here. And I think 70% of people look at me and go, what the hell is this guy talking about? <laughs> Did he really just say the earth was flat? <laughs> I know. Well, here's what I would like to do. Because I I think we could have a conversation all afternoon. But I really want to dive more into the tactical aspects of what you're doing and selling. And I would like to see what I can contribute with just my past experience in sales and marketing with that. So why don't we find a time again to sit down and talk more exclusively about kind of this whole idea of breaking into a market. Mm -hmm. What are some of the fundamentals of pursuing a marketing program? Some of the fundamentals of sales and Mm -hmm. kind of what you're doing and how that works into a, an actual revenue. Well, you have to think about it. There's hundreds of, we'll just say, I'm always finance, hundreds of financial advisors, thousands, you know, but they each have a different niche. So they might provide pretty much 99% of the same thing, but they do one thing differently. And that's all they needed to capture that one market. And I kind of feel cannabis will be the same way. There'll be companies are created, but it's going to be for a specific market. And you can have four or five or hundreds of the same company just going after a different market. The reason I like to help out where I can is because I think I look at sales a little differently than probably most people who are in sales because 
I've had the opportunity to do a lot of shitty sales in my life. A lot of telemarketing, uh. a lot of door-to-door, a lot of booth conference types, you mm. know, standing kiosks. And that's uh, a lot of work. A lot of demonstration. And We're a lot s- of face-to-face rejection. Yeah. And my, my first sales job was at nine years old when I would go door-to-door. What were you selling at nine? Uh, greeting cards and stationery. Um, <laughs> Did you come up with that all by yourself? No. In the, the comic books I would read, the very last page of the comic <laughs> really? book, they would have all these toys, a page of toys. And the way you got the toys was by accumulating so many points. And the points were you would write the company a letter saying, I wanted to sell the greeting cards and stationery for these points. And they would send you a box of greeting cards and stationeries. And if you sold them, then that would let you exchange them for the toys in the magazine. Ah. So I, I lived in a small town. Obviously, it wasn't a big city. I lived Did you in... grow up here? Remind me again. No, I, I've moved all around. I was born in Wisconsin. Oh, okay. And then lived mostly in the southwest Four Corners area, Farmington, Cortez, Dolores. Oh, okay, yeah, New Mexico. Um, Shiprock, right around that Four Corners. But uh, when I was nine, I would go door to door in my neighborhood selling these greeting cards so I could get the toys. Mm. That that was my first memory and I would say legitimate sales job of doing that. You were an entrepreneur at nine. I was. And then at uh, 12, I, I started uh, doing the paper out for my brother because he was the troublemaker. And this was back in the days when kids were actually allowed to throw paper. Deliver papers. Yep. They would drop them off at your door at 4.30 in the morning and you would have to get up. You would roll them, put the rubber bands around them, put them in your big bike, bag. Bike or maybe bike. Or, or bike. Yeah, I walked. Um, you ever see a better off dead? Of course. Two dollars. <laughs> that was my second sales job because I my I wasn't old enough to be a paper boy, but my brother being so irresponsible yeah. wasn't doing it. So I had to do his route and then go collect the money at the end of the month. So that was kind of my second little intro to asking people for money, right? Yeah. And then uh, at 14, I started doing uh, the subscription sales, door-to-door selling the Denver mm-hmm. Post. Yeah. And then right after high school, went directly into door-to-door high-priced item sales, selling $3,000 vacuum cleaners. Oh, did you have the rainbow with the water? <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> Please. <laughs> the water. Don't even get me started on that's my a whole demonstration. another episode. Vacuums. Let me go into the whole idea that water is not a filter, folks. Water does not filter. Water gets <laughs> dirty, but it does not actually filter. What it does is it suppresses gas. This is why in our toilets and our sinks we have the dipping pipe. Yeah. It's a smell repressant. It's not a filter. <laughs> if you take a if you take a powder put like powdered sugar in a straw, right? Yeah. And blow it through there, it's going to come right through there. <laughs> Water's not filter. <laughs> to filter, you need an actual paper yeah. or some type I of I don't stuff. have the rainbow, but I saw that demo at my house. I'm <laughs> I like, sold the, uh, amazing. I sold the filter queens, uh, the majestic oh. filter queens. They were $2,750. And if you got the attachment air room air filter for another $700, it was like 3200 total package type thing. Oh and there God. were in-home demonstrations. And then I went from that to selling the expensive knives, went to that to uh, straight into mortgage, started selling mortgages, and then went from from selling mortgages to financial companies doing over the phone hardcore telesales. Cold calling, smiling. Cold calling, dial. selling like multi thousand dollar financial yep. type plans. Yep. As I didn't have any licenses, I was just a telemarketer. Right? Yeah, so yeah. I, was, I, I wasn't an you. advisor, yeah. it wasn't anybody. <laughs> Um, and then just kept doing various types of marketing and sales, marketing and sales, marketing and sales. I was a teacher for a while. I'm in Mexico. English as a okay. teacher. I got my certification through the University of Cambridge, my CELTA, which is a certificate of English language teaching to adults. And then used my background in marketing and sales to establish my own company in Mexico, selling English language services to businesses. Even then, I was still looking for what I'm still looking for today, which is just to combine my interest of business and media and now cannabis Mm -hmm. kind of combine those but still doing what I've kind of always done which is just engaging with people with their ideas and Mm -hmm. businesses and trying to bring stuff to reality yeah yeah and that's kind of where I'm at to this point yeah 2015 I'm here saying I'm trying to build a platform Mm -hmm. that other people can talk about their businesses form to allow other people to talk about Mm -hmm. this and it allows me to talk about cannabis and it still and you learn so much Right. And yeah. and that's going back to the beginning of our conversation of ultimately that's all I'm ever trying to do. When I'm attacking people with my questions, it's because it's I'm the attack- curious one. It's not attacking. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. That's one thing I love right now is that I'm so open to people's viewpoints and how they see things. Like they love the parties or they love the consultation, but they always have great, you know, 
know, great no. things I can tweak. And I'm like, that's a brilliant idea. So it's just nice to be moldable right now. Yeah. I feel like I was so rigid. It's nice to feel that fluid again. And, and that's really what the happiness is, right? Yeah. Is we're all just looking for some place where I can come home at the end of the day and feel excited, but yet tired because I did, did mm-hmm. work, but yet still excited about what I did. And when I have the chance to engage with somebody, you know, I was, I was really excited engaging with you at, at mm-hmm. the because it gives me the uh, the ability to think about these things. And well, we've been engaging now for how many months? Since September, couple, right? Like that. I'd already quit my job, so it's been at least so. seven weeks or something. I don't know. We were but at the, the, like the high a, hikes. Yeah, the high and hike, and then we've been seeing each other at New Conscience. Yeah, yeah. So that gives me energy. You know, yeah. when, when I when I'm like, oh, you need you that. Know, here's you need to be able to charge your batteries when you're exhausted. All of that. Well, the way I charge my batteries are by being alone or by engaging with somebody with some type of productive activity yeah, and trying to figure out how to best position a booth to sell a product to me is in a productive engaging activity Mm -hmm. and it fires me up as they say so I appreciate when somebody responds to that and uh, that's definitely why it was a natural lead into well let's just sit down and talk more Yeah, I get ready when you come over to the table I'm like okay he's gonna drill me gotta be ready well see you say that like like, oh that's a good thing I think most people see that same approach and they're like uh, what's this guy coming to No, because you can be anybody that could come through my table and I need to be able to handle any type of personality um, and not let it get to my heart. So I love it. I love the practice. I accept it with open arms. The reason why I really like helping people with sales is because I'm naturally a very shy person. I'm always, as a kid, very shy, very closed. Um, Me too. Very difficult to speak in front of, you know, even my own parents. You know, just... Oh, yeah. Just very closed, very shy, and very closed in the sense of I, I never wanted anybody to know anything about me. I know me too. I didn't want anything, but I didn't know anything about me. I didn't mm-hmm. want to reveal anything about mm-hmm. myself. I didn't want to speak. In fr- I didn't want people to know I was there in any real sense of the way. And working through years of sales has allowed me to, as you put it, put on that mask, but to put it on in a less artificial way. Yeah. To have it be a mask that's part of me, but one that I can take on and but off. But one that embraces the other person, I mean, still keeping your true self. That's just who I am. Him because I, just, I I like to dispense information, and I think people sometimes find that very abrasive. Excellent. Thing yeah. uh, whatever you want to do, I, I'd be more yeah. than happy to work with you. Absolutely. Um, you know where to find me. <laughs> let's do this again. Let's make you part of my show. Oh, so, I love uh, people that. People can hear more. We of could stories. be um, like a morning show. I oh, don't push you now. <laughs> <laughs> One more time. Name. Oh yes, I'm Hetty <laughs> Becca, independent consultant with a healthy Hetty lifestyle. We are in-home cannabis education and vaporizer demonstration. We're the Mary Kay of the Mary J. You can find us online on HealthyHetty.com. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm Hetty Becca. And if you do want to place orders on the Healthy Hetty website, if you do just want to purchase something and don't want to demo it, you can certainly purchase through the website. And when you check out in the affiliate, put Becca and I get the credit. But thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time. I appreciate it. I always love talking to people, especially when they're engaging. And I feel like we just barely scratched the surface. Oh, we could talk for hours. Conversations go. I think we're always the last one to leave. Kind of like I'm trying to pack up and talk and get out and <laughs> cool. Well, we'll do it again then. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Should we go get drunk now? <laughs> <laughs> so sick. Let's go get high now. Yeah. Did you bring any vapes? I did. Thanks for listening to this week's show. Make sure to come back next week. We're going to have more guests lined up speaking with dispensary owners, growers, business owners. Make sure to follow us on all of the social media, Facebook, Google+. You can listen to our shows live from the website or your preferred listening platform. Find us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spreaker, even YouTube, all under the same name, CannabisCommunityProject.com. We'll see you next week. Come on!